The NASCAR Cup Series has held nearly 2,700 races across more than 170 different tracks since its inception in 1949. And of those 170 tracks to host a big league NASCAR event, they ranged all the way from ultra-modern, state-of-the-art cathedrals of speed to simple dirt ovals carved out into the countryside. But the true magic of NASCAR is that you don't have to dump millions into a facility for it to be a fan favorite. A little ingenuity and some good management can go a long way in making both drivers and fans alike happy as can be. But some tracks today live on in infamy, detested by drivers and viewers alike, and some even by the people who built and managed them. Maybe the tracks produced boring races, maybe they were a dump nobody wanted to go to, or possibly they were just so dangerous that drivers said to hell with racing there, or in a few cases, all of the above. So today let's take a look at what I think are the top 10 worst tracks to have ever appeared on the NASCAR Cup Series schedule. To make this list there are only two criteria. One, you have to have hosted at least one cup race to date, and two, the track has to have a fairly uniform history of being bad in some respect. I'll be looking at the track's overall history inside and outside of NASCAR. So a stretch of bad races recently will not override decades of good racing prior. So with all of that taken into consideration, let's get into it. Number 10, Talladega Super Speedway. What? All right, let me explain. Okay, so Talladega today is a fan favorite with rabid turnout, drunken days-long parties taking place in the infield, and great close pack racing happening on a regular basis. But there are a lot of underlying issues that just barely put it on this list. When the track first saw the light of day in 1969, it was mired in controversy. A tire war between Goodyear and Firestone led to a driver walkout and only three competitive cars took to the track, as field fillers were brought in at the last second. Bobby Isaac, one of those competitive cars, dropped back early on. And then of those two that were left, a scoring error means that we're not even sure which one of them actually won the race, even to this day. Add that rocky start to a litany of driver injuries and fatalities, and now we're talking about a track that is almost too dangerous to run at. NASCAR legend Tiny Lunn lost his life here, Wendell Scott suffered a career-ending injury, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. had a wreck in 2012 that gave him a bad concussion and eventually led to his early retirement at the end of the 2017 season. And if all of that wasn't bad enough, Bobby Isaac once pulled off the track in the middle of a race and got out of his car because he said he heard voices in his head that told him to stop or else. Later in that same race, Rookie of the Year winner from the previous year, Larry Smith, died in an accident. And let's not forget about Bobby Allison's 1987 crash and Carl Edwards' 2009 wreck. Now we have to talk about how this is one of the few tracks where fans actually risk life and limb just sitting in the stands. And we haven't even talked about the multi-car pileups that make car owners seethe with anger at the mere mention of this track's name. The big one is such a ubiquitous event associated with Talladega that nobody wonders if it's going to happen or even when. It's a matter of how many times it will happen throughout the day. Nowadays, races at Talladega are so marred by wrecks that they routinely go over their allotted runtime. And just this year at the second Talladega race, the event got booted off of network TV and was sent to cable, and hundreds of thousands of people never even got to see the end of the race. Oh, and I haven't even mentioned the yellow line rule yet, but hey, that's a topic for another video. It's a fun track, no doubt, but man does it have one sordid history and a lot of modern kinks to hammer out. How racing at Talladega will look as the years roll on is yet to be seen, but whatever happens, it will remain a fan favorite for a long time, no matter how badly it hurts the wallets of every team in the sport. Number 9, Kentucky Speedway. Only a phenomenal final race in 2020 saved this track from being higher on the list, but with years of boring cookie-cutter races under its belt, it's safe to say that Kentucky left a lot to be desired. The one and a half mile track with 14 degrees of banking was a product of its time and was part of an expansionist phase with NASCAR to put big venues in big markets, but it just never took off. When it was brought onto the schedule in 2011, hopes were high for this track. It had originally been built in 2000, and with the 11-year-old surface and ultra-wide track, many thought the racing would be phenomenal, as it had been in the Bush and Arca series from the previous decade. But the track just produced snooze fests. On top of that, its first race in 2011 was plagued with infrastructure issues, and a massive traffic jam on opening day meant that thousands couldn't even make it to the track for the green flag. Later they fixed these issues, but in 2015 another problem popped up. Drainage problems were compounded by weepers in the turns that held water and slowly expelled it onto the track over the course of hours. So even when the rain stopped, the track would take hours upon hours to fully dry. They repaved it for the 2016 season with higher banks in turns 1 and 2, but 3 and 4 were left at their normal 14 degrees, and the width of the track was also reduced from 72 feet to 56 feet, so that its one saving grace of a wide track surface was taken away. Despite being near the promising markets close to Louisville and Cincinnati, in 2020 it was announced that it would be dropped from the schedule for the 2021 season, and very few NASCAR fans mourned its passing. Instead, it was met with a firm, good riddance. Number 8, Raleigh Speedway. 
Today we race fans get peeved at people who decide to build their homes next to active racetracks and then complain that there's too much noise. Myrtle Beach was torn down in part because of such complaints, Nashville has to deal with strict curfews and noise ordinances to this very day, and Laguna Seca can only hold races on certain pre-approved weekends. This is of course absurd, if you don't like the noise perhaps you shouldn't have built your house next to a racetrack, I mean what did you think went on there? But what about the opposite happening? What if you built your house far away from the hustle and bustle of the city, only to have a one mile super speedway built on your backyard? Well that happened in Raleigh, North Carolina. Built in 1952, Raleigh Speedway was one of NASCAR's first paved super speedways, being one mile in length with 16 degree banks. It offered up some of the biggest prize pools in NASCAR at that time, and IndyCar races were also popular at the venue. They even installed stadium lights at the track and would usually race the Cup Series on the night of July 4th. But that only exacerbated the problem with the locals, who had to deal with the noise all throughout the year from modified races and weekly racing on the quarter mile infield track. In 1953, the track had two fatalities in one night, when Bill Blevins stalled on the backstretch coming to take the green flag. The track's lighting was dim and Bill's burgundy car was hard to see from the press box nearly half a mile away. So NASCAR started the race thinking nothing was wrong. But then as the cars came around, everybody scrambled to miss Blevins, except Jesse Midkiff who hit him head on and both drivers died instantly. That event thereafter was referred to as Black Saturday and it gave the track a dangerous reputation. And with complaints against the Speedway continuing to pile up, when promoter Bill Franz had an open slot for Daytona for the July 4th weekend of 1959, he canceled the race at Raleigh and moved the date to Daytona where it remained until just this year. The track was abandoned shortly thereafter and the land was repurposed over the years. However, a portion of the backstretch still remains in the woods next to a Duke Energy substation. And as fate would have it, the portion remaining is the site of Blevins and Midkiff's fatal accident. Number 7. Islip Speedway one of just a few tracks ever built on Long Island, New York, Islip Speedway is credited with hosting the first demolition derby and figure eight races ever. A novel idea from track owner Larry Mendelson drew in tons of fans and they ended up sticking around for the real racing, quote unquote, that went on too. It was a massive draw for modifieds, but the Cup Series also came by from 1964 until 1971, and the races were big hits with the fans. So what's the problem? The track was just way too small. It holds the distinction of being the smallest track to ever host a cup race at just one-fifth of a mile long, even smaller than Bowman Gray Stadium. And the Cup Series was bringing 25 to 33 cars per race. It was so bad that guys in the back of the pack would know when to take the green flag because they could see the leaders taking it in their rearview mirrors. Also due to its small size, it was incredibly hard to pass. During its entire run in the Cup Series across six races, there were a combined 12 lead changes. That's it. Plus, when you take into consideration that it was halfway up Long Island, and the logistical nightmare that that must have been driving through New York City just to get there when there's another race just a few days later in Maine, yeah, there's no way Islip was going to work out long term. It lived on as a draw for the Modifieds until the 1980s when it was torn down to build a cookie factory of all things. Number 6. Columbia Speedway Hosting one of the last dirt races ever in the Cup Series in 1970, Columbia Speedway in Casey, South Carolina was a massive draw for the Cup Series and weekly racing series for decades. Its hard packed dirt surface produced fast racing and intense side by side action that was so good that the Cup Series routinely came here two or sometimes even three times per year. And as such, the list of winners here reads like a list of Hall of Famers. Fans loved the track and turned out in droves to watch the races of all kinds out here, and it even had lights for night racing during the hot summer months. So what's the problem? Uh, the track had some serious design flaws in its construction. To put it bluntly, it was just really, really outdated. The walls and the turns were just thick wooden planking held in place with telephone poles, and one time David Pearson careened through the wall in turn one and ended up in a little creek in the woods. Plus, the front stretch wall was literally just three rows of railroad rails hoisted up by more rails set into the ground in three feet of concrete, meaning that if a car hit it, it would almost certainly be torn apart and a rail might get lodged inside the car and impale a driver. While that never happened in the Cup Series, there was an instance of a motorcycle racer who fell off of his bike and hit the railing at high speed and died instantly. Many local late model racers and NASCAR guys flat out refused to race here citing safety concerns. And when the track was paved in 1971, the faster speeds made even more drivers anxious about racing here. Add that to the tiny pit road and you have a track that was never going to survive the modernization efforts of 1972. And Columbia was abandoned shortly thereafter. In 2010, the land was reclaimed and the track lives on today as a venue for concerts, car shows, and other outdoor events. Number 5. Texas Motor Speedway 
Okay, so the litany of reasons why this track ended up being so high on the list is a long one, but here's the Cliff Notes version. Originally built as a state-of-the-art track that would host NASCAR and IndyCar races, track owner Bruton Smith bought out North Wilkesboro Speedway and left it to rot in North Carolina just so he could have a guaranteed race date. <laughs> Then in testing, a month before its first race in 1997, it was found out that pit lane was too narrow and the transitions out of the corners were horrible. So they made a bunch of last minute fixes to the track and there was a massive pile up on the first lap of the race anyway. They spent millions to reconfigure the track, there was another wreck fest of a race in 1998 and they spent another two million reconfiguring it again. And after all that, the track only produced mediocre racing. The infrastructure and amenities at the track were top notch, but dwindling crowds have many NASCAR fans wondering if the Dallas Fort Worth area is a market worth staying at. Stands that used to sit over 150,000 people are now lucky to get a third as many people to show up on race day. And another reconfiguring in 2017 where banking in turns one and two was reduced made racing even more lackluster. The track used to have some marquee events on the NASCAR and IndyCar schedules, but with Chicago and Kentucky both being dropped for 2021 out of the blue, many wonder if Texas will receive the same fate as the years roll on. Number 4. Tulsa Fairground Speedway a mainstay in the early IndyCar days, Tulsa was set up to be a foray into the Western market for NASCAR in 1956. One day prior, a race at the Oklahoma State Fairgrounds in Oklahoma City was held, but only about 12 cars showed up for that race and Jim Pascal ended up with the W after it was all said and done. The next day, the same guys headed over to Tulsa for a 200 lap event at the Half Mile Dirt Oval at the fairgrounds. But it was in the middle of a drought in early August and the track had not been kept up or prepared for a race. And with no water being put on the track, it created tons of dust. The dust was so bad that announcers couldn't even see who was where on the track, and drivers said they couldn't even see three feet in front of them. Fans were reportedly coughing up dirt and running out of the grandstands to catch their breath. And after 32 laps, Lee Petty, who was running second, pulled into the pits, walked across the track while the race was still going on, kicked open the crossover gate, climbed up to the flag stand, and took the red flag for himself to wave the race off. Officially, on lap 34, the race was halted and never resumed. No prize money or points were awarded, and everybody packed up and left and acted as though the race had never even happened in the first place. NASCAR never came back to the state of Oklahoma ever again. Yeah, one horrible race ended NASCAR's plans for westward expansion. They'd stay mostly a southeastern sport for decades to come. Tulsa lived on hosting dirt races for years afterwards, though, in other series. But in 2009, it was closed down and demolished one year later. Number 3. Airbase Speedway Longtime viewers will immediately know why this track made the list, but for those of you just hearing about this track for the first time, let me give you the rundown. Originally called Greenville Textile Speedway, this track was built by Charlie Hicks in Greenville, South Carolina in 1949. It hosted tons of local races with late models, modifieds, motorcycles, and more. It even had lights and held night races, a rarity for the time. In 1950, the track changed its name to Airbase Speedway, in honor of the Donaldson Air Force Base just north of the track. Later that year, one race had to be called off in the middle of the main event for bad track conditions. And despite being billed as the fastest track in the southeast, qualifying times were horrendously slow. As it turned out, Charlie Hicks really didn't have any clue what he was doing. The track also had no permanent amenities to speak of, and was overall just a kind of slapdash ramshackle affair. Hell, the track utilized wooden walls all the way up until its dying day. Despite bad track conditions, slow speeds, and virtually nothing in the way of luxuries for fans, Charlie Hicks did manage to weasel his way onto the 1951 Cup Series schedule with an August 25th race date. The race went off without any issues, and Bob Flock won. But when Buck Baker tried to lease the track at the end of the year, he ran into a problem. Hicks had tried to procure a loan for the track, but never disclosed that the facility had a lien on it from the bank. That netted him a fraud charge and a whopping fine of $19,000 in today's money, and that would eventually put him under. The track was sold and left to rot over the course of decades. It's now the site of an industrial park, but if you know where to look, you can still find a section of the backstretch today tucked away in the woods. Number 2. Texas World Speedway Located in College Station, Texas, Texas World was supposed to be the next leap forward in tracks made for NASCAR. It was built as a one-for-one -one copy of Michigan International with a two-mile D-shaped configuration. But Texas's banks were four degrees steeper for a total of 22 degrees. It held its first races in 1969 and would host NASCAR and IndyCar races just one year later. But in the first few years, something was amiss. The track was fast, there were plenty of lead changes and drivers seemed to like the track itself, but the amenities left a lot to be desired. Building a two-mile super speedway ain't cheap, and the original builders had cut corners where they could. 
Rumors about bathrooms not working or overflowing persisted, and even by the standards of the time, everything except the product on the track was lagging sorely behind expectations. Fewer and fewer folks kept coming out to the races, and by the mid-70s, the track was taken off the schedule and changed hands in ownership a few times. One owner even went bankrupt trying to keep the place going. It came back from 1979 through 1981, but by then it was clear that the new owners were just barely scraping by, and the track was falling apart at the seams. Not to mention people still would not show up to the races. After 1981, the NASCAR Cup Series never came back, but Texas World would go on to be bought out by a Japanese company who gave it a much needed repave in the 1990s, and it hosted some Bush East and ARCA races until they too left. And the only sanctioning body left at the track was the Sports Car Club of America who utilized the three mile infield road course all the way up until the track's dying day in 2017. Nowadays, the track is in the slow and steady process of being demolished, but with the economy grinding to a halt, so has its destruction. So it still remains standing for now. A multi-million dollar track with big ambitions falling apart from day one and a rotating door of owners who could never make it work meant that fans never wanted to turn out to the Speedway and off into the history books it went. Man, between it and Texas Motor Speedway and Coda and possible financial trouble, you might start wondering why we're even in the Texas market in the first place. It honestly seems like they just don't like auto racing down there, but that's a video for another time. Number one, Langhorne Speedway. Widely considered by many at the time to be the most dangerous track in the U.S., Langhorne Speedway in Langhorne, Pennsylvania was a one-mile, almost perfectly circular dirt oval. And since the whole track was basically one gigantic left-hand turn, that meant that drivers were constantly in the throttle, and any mechanical failure or crash would result in a pile-up into the outside wall, which was just a thin strip of guardrail. No less than 18 drivers died at the track, and many more were injured over the years. Bobby Unzer said of the track, that was the most dangerous track on earth. I can't imagine another track being that dangerous. Both NASCAR and IndyCar drivers feared racing there, but that didn't stop it from being a hit with the fans. It routinely drew in 20,000 or more attendees at a time when most tracks couldn't even get half that. And being so close to the big market of Philadelphia didn't hurt either. While NASCAR stopped coming here in the late 50s, IndyCar pressed on. But in the 70s when the track was paved and speeds became even faster, the danger was just too much and drivers boycotted the race. Langhorne was sold and demolished not too long afterwards. It was a founding track in NASCAR with a lot of history, but unfortunately, its configuration and lack of safety features sealed its fate. Anyway, I'm Slapshoes, thanks for watching, and until next time, y'all take it easy.